Yes, thank you. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm doing my PhD at the University of Toronto. For those of you who don't know, that stands for permanent head damage. So we're just, don't let credentials fool you. There's, there's a lot more behind it than you might think. And I am the Central Canadian Director for an organization called Apologetics Canada. And I do a lot of work like I'm doing tonight, coming and sharing and talking, but for really the last seven years, I worked with a campus ministry and a number of campus ministries in doing apologetic and interfaith dialogue work. So I did a, a lot of work. My academic area of study is in the history of the text of the Bible, and some of that led over into comparing the text of the Bible and its veracity in history with the text of other religious texts, texts like the Quran, texts like the Bhagavad Gita, texts like the Sutras. And so my work had me doing a lot of dialogues and debates with other world religious perspectives, Muslims, atheists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the like. And so in terms of the question that we're going to be talking about this evening, um, in terms of the worldview question, I want to just open by reciting a, a bit of a parable that has encapsulated kind of the worldview perspective that is more popular and pervasive in our culture. There's a parable, more like a proverb, that dates uh, quite a few centuries, if not millennia back from India, known as the blind men and the elephant. It went like this. It was six men of India, of learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall, against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second feeling of the tusk cried, oh, what have we here? So very... So very round and smooth and sharp, to me it's mighty clear, the wonder of the elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, said he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee, when what most this wondrous beast like is mighty plain, said he, is very clear enough, the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, I, the mightiest man, can tell what the, this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. The marvel of the elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing in his swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, said he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of India disputed loud and long, each in their own opinion exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. And basically, the parable illustrates this idea of really this multi-faith pluralism, that we're all in the human species throughout the time frame of humanity grasping at different parts of what might be the transcendent. But because it's so big, because it's so unknowable, we reach out and grab different aspects. And so the Muslim might get a part of who God is, and the Hindu might get a part of God, who God is, and the Christian might get a part. And we might be confident and enthusiastic about what we truly believe is the truth about in this case, what the elephant looks like, but we're all blind and can't see the picture in its entirety. Now, the, the, the crux of this argument is that in the Christian worldview, the elephant opens his mouth and speaks and tells us what he looks like. In fact, even for the parable to make sense, it assumes that someone knows what the elephant looks like in order to make sense of the parable. So in reality, the parable illustrates something, but maybe not what it's original intent was. But really, what we see in, in a lot of our uh, kind of worldview perspectives in the broader, broader culture is illustrated in uh, a video that someone sent me not that long ago that looked like this. Meet Jay. Hi, my name is Jay and I had six religions. When Jay says all religions are the same, he means it because he tried a lot of them. He was born Catholic, then switched to Protestant, then explored Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, Latter-day Saints, and Taoism. But I passed on them. Then he joined Islam, prayed five times a day, and celebrated their holidays. 
for two years. Then he stumbled upon Sikhism. It resonated well with me. So he became Sikh. And shortly after, he became Hindu. But that's not the end of it. Later on, Jay found Judaism. And now is exploring the idea of becoming Jewish. But when you ask Jay, why are you switching so many religions? He'll say, I'm not. All religions are like fingers pointing to the same moon. Except people, he says, spend too much time focusing on the fingers, but not the moon. That's one minute. See you tomorrow. So that's a video produced by, as you can see on the screen, Nas Daily. He does 60-second video, one-minute videos, and illustrating different things about his travels and some of the things he's been learning. And so Nas interviews Jay, and Jay has this perspective that kind of illustrates what the original question or the original statement was that Jacob read, right? God wants everybody to be good, as illustrated in the Bible, and all the worldly perspectives, whether they're religious or otherwise, also claim that. And so in that sense, they're all really saying the same thing, maybe just in different angles. The um, movie director, George Lucas, put it this way once. He said, I remember when I was 10 years old, I asked my mother, if there's only one God, why are there so many religions? I've been pondering that question ever since, and the conclusion I've come to is that all religions are true. It's kind of like the coexist bumper sticker that we sometimes see that people put on the back of their cars. The problem with this is that it assumes a few things. It assumes that disagreement equals dissent, that we couldn't disagree in sort of the fundamentals of what the perspectives hold, that that would be negative. But realistically, I think that I want less to be tolerant and more to be respectful of the disagreements that we actually hold. And tolerance, not respect, is the ultimate virtue. Toleration actually is a negative thing. You know, we sometimes use it in a positive. You know, you'll hear politicians say we, we need to be a tolerant society, but realistically, we then use it more often in a negative. You tolerate someone at the expense of that person. If you were to uh, be in the city of Toronto tomorrow and you happen to uh, see me talking to someone else and saying, you know, oh, I, I heard you went to that, that a church last night and spoke. I say, yeah, you know, I, I did. I gave a talk. And they said, oh, what do you think of the, the people who, who showed up at the talk? I said, well, I could tolerate them. Well, how, how is their demeanor? How is the you know, environment of the church? Oh, it's tolerable. No, that's not a positive, right? You would then have reason to maybe not want to invite me back. But toleration, I don't think, is the kind of virtue that we should be aiming for. I think we should look for a respectful dialogue to uh, realize that there are disagreements. Now, part of the problem with this whole situation is not all worldviews and religions claim to lead to God. Now, we could argue that atheism, although it's not a religious worldview, it attempts to answer the ultimate questions. You know, why are we here? How do we get here? How do we get out of here? Those type of big you ultimate questions. And so atheism ultimately ascribes to there being no God, death, destruction, and then oblivion being the end. So atheism is not claiming to lead you to God. A Buddhism, in a very similar way, although it's not atheistic, traditional Buddhism is non-theistic. There is no ultimate divine power in Buddhism. In fact, the ultimate goal of Bud Buddhism is to realize that your personality, you, as a, a being that exists right now doesn't actually exist, that that's an illusion, and you, the pursuit of Buddhism through, you know, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, is to ultimately seek your destruction where your consciousness will be absorbed into the universe. That's what nirvana is. It's a cessation, it's a ceasing of you existing. Well, that's not claiming to lead you to God. It's not. That doesn't exist within Buddhism. Islam, in the same way, although it does have uh, a divine figure, right, uh, often used uh, with the, the Arabic title Allah, which is just Arabic for God, but does have a God. But if you read the Islamic li literature, what you find out is that in heaven, in paradise, God is not there. God is still too transcendent, too above humanity, that even in paradise, God's not there. And so when you die, you're not taken to God, you're taken to paradise, but 
that's not a place where God resides. Similarly, Hinduism, uh, in a similar way, although not exactly like Buddhism, has aspects that are non-theistic, has aspects that are polytheistic, henotheistic. You know, there are multiple variations of the Hindu faith. But similar to Buddhism, they believe in a more formal understanding of reincarnation, of life, death, birth, and rebirth. And so the purpose is not to be led to God, it's to end the cycle of reincarnation and become one with the Brahma, with the, the, what we would essentially call the universe. It's not leading you to God. In fact, I would argue that if you study worldview perspectives, only Christianity, with the promise of the right relationship with God, establishing the relationship between the creation and the creator in the garden, and that through the grace of God, through God stepping out of eternity and into humanity, into our depravity in the second person of the Trinity in Jesus Christ, is seeking to lead you to God. It's the one where we will be reunited with God in the new heavens and the new earth. So in that way, this claim that all religions are the same, they're all trying to lead you to God, all religions aren't claiming to lead you to God. In fact, I would argue that Christianity is the only one that's truly trying to lead you to God. A number of years ago, um, I had a, a, a short Bollywood career in India. It's a true story, but a different presentation. And so th there was a particular summer where I was, I was uh, what was referred to as a special skills extra in N New Delhi, India. And we had uh, a couple of days off, and so we were trying to do the, the typical tourist uh, sightsee thing. And I got into a rickshaw, and the rickshaw driver didn't take me where I wanted to go, but he did take me here. And this building that's on the screen is the Grand Baha'i Lotus Temple. And the Baha'i faith is a faith that is truly pluralistic. They're kind of what uh, in philosophy is sometimes called cafeteria religion. You know, you take the things you like, ignore the things you don't, and you go from there. And this is the, the largest temple for the Baha'i faith. And so I didn't mind being stuck here, and so I was walking around, and I uh, found the only other white guy uh, in the area because we were easy to spot. And there was another guy who was a... Uh, he was on a pilgrimage. He was from California originally, and he'd come to India, and he was studying at the Grand Baha'i Lotus Temple. And he came up to me, and he introduced himself by saying, Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm Baha'i, and I believe that all ways lead to God. And I said, that's really interesting. My name's Wes. I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and I believe that one way leads to God. And he went, oh, no, 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 I, I can't accept that. And I went, hold on a minute. You're excluding me. And he went, no, 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 we want to include everybody. You see, the problem with, that was revealed by this particular interaction is that even as an inclusivist wanting to include everybody, this individual still betrayed the fact that the inclusivists have to exclude the exclusivists. He still has to exclude me because I don't fit within his box of everything's true. Because my worldview ultimately said, that everything is not true. If I say 2 plus 2 is 4 and he says 2 plus 2 is 6, one of us is right and one of us is wrong. And it might, you know, have very minor implications until we try to do our taxes. <laughs> really, if you look at religious worldviews, especially the main ones, ultimately they are all exclusivistic. Uh, within Islam, when you become a Muslim, you say a statement of faith. It's known as the Shahada. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasul Allah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. You say it in Arabic, although I didn't just become a Muslim because I don't really mean it. But that's the statement that you make. Now, that is ultimately an exclusivistic statement. It excludes everybody who doesn't believe that Allah is the only God and that Muhammad is the prophet of God. Similarly, although it's kind of uh, often illustrated as more inclusivistic, Buddhism is exclusivistic. The Buddha... The original character, uh, Gautama Siddhartha, was uh, an Indian priest, or Indian prince, rather, who eventually rejected the faith he grew up in, Hinduism, called it evil, said that the caste system and the authority of the Vedas, which are essential to Hinduism, were wrong and detrimental and evil. And in that sense, he excluded Hinduism. So 
in his sort of formation of the path to enlightenment, he had to make statements that excluded other paths that he said were false and detrimental. Um, similarly, Hinduism has, even though there are multiple versions and brands and concepts within Hinduism, ultimately has this idea of one ultimate power source, but that power source is impersonal. The Brahma, the divine energy, is impersonal, and so Christianity and, and Islam and Judaism, which all talk about a personal God, has to be excluded by Hinduism. And Judaism, arguably from the time of Moses to modern Orthodox Jews today, repeat a statement every morning and every evening called the Shema. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 4. Hear, o Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. That's exclusivistic to religions that claim that there is more than one God. And obviously in Christianity we have Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Religions and worldly perspectives are ultimately not saying the same thing. They ultimately have differentiations that maybe, if they agree in the minors, disagree in the majors. It's not the similarities that make the difference. It's the differences that make the difference. All, all the world religions disagree on are things like who is God, who are we, why are we here, our purpose, our meaning, sin, morality, destiny, heaven, hell, you know, the small things. The things that don't really make the difference, right? No, those are all the major things. And even in the sense of the original statement that, you know, all these want people to do good, I think there is a, a kernel of truth there in the sense of when I do presentations on university campuses, I get people who come up to me and they say things like, Wes, you don't get it. Because all the religions really boil down to some form of the golden rule, right? Jesus says in the gospel biography written by Matthew, in everything therefore do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And it is true that if you study world religions, you will find versions of this. In Buddhism, there's a proverb, treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. In Hinduism, there's a mantra, do not do to others what would cause pain if done to you. In the Eastern religion, Zoroastrianism, there is a statement, do not do unto others whatever is injurious to yourself. And the closest one that I could find was actually from Confucius, who said, do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself. But notice there's a subtle but important difference. Jesus frames his in the positive. Almost all of these major world religions, when they have a version, frame it in the negative. And there is a difference between not punching someone in the face and building someone a hospital. You might not have picked up on it, but it is there. So in that sense, yes, there are forms of the golden rule, but it's not the similarities that make the difference, it's the differences that make the difference. In the same way that Advil and arsenic both come in pill form. But when I have a headache, there's a very specific reason why I don't open the cupboard and pick the arsenic over the Advil, right? One's going to help my headache and one's going to kill me. So it's not the similarities that make the difference in that sense, it's the differences. And when you really evaluate these worldviews, you find out that the differences are substantial. The comedian Ricky Gervais one time said, there are something like 3,000 religions that exist today. Unless you've investigated all of them, how can you possibly say yours is right. Now, Ricky Gervais didn't make this up. It actually comes from Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion. Now, this is, although it might seem like a, a, a smart statement, in reality, you don't need to investigate all 3,000 or however many there actually are religions or worldviews in order to know which one is true. In the same sense that in a murder investigation, when the forensic detective goes to the judge and says, here's my evidence for subject A, the judge doesn't go, do you know how many people are on the planet? There are like six billion people on the planet. You think, you, you think he's the right guy? You think he's the person? Now, why would that be a silly answer? Well, 
you don't need extraordinary claims to be backed up by extraordinary evidence. You just need sufficient claims to back up, sufficient evidence rather, to back up extraordinary claims. And when you have the evidence pointing to a particular conclusion, you can go with that, even if there are six billion options to who committed a particular crime. Now, is it useful to study other world religions? Yes, I, I think it is, I, I do a lot of that. But fraud investigators don't study all the different versions of counterfeit bills. They study what the original bill looks like so well that when the counterfeits show up, they know what to look for. They know what the truth looks like. And so we come full circle to Jay, who says that all world religions are the same moon, but we focus too much on the fingers that are pointing and not enough to what they're pointing to. But I think the fault in that is that not all the fingers even claim there's a moon to begin with. Some are pointing in completely different directions. Some claim there aren't a moon. Some claim that they don't have any fingers. And so Jay is a little bit naive in saying that he can just bounce from religion to religion to religion. Now, I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm an academic. I, I, I do a lot of reading. And if I were to tell you that last night, I went down to the University of Toronto, I went to Robarts Library, and I started reading on the first bookshelf I saw, and from sunup to sundown, and then the next morning, I read all the books in the library. I read very fast. I read everything. Everything from Mein Kampf to One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Everything. And I came to an extraordinary realization. The realization I came to was that all the books are saying the same thing. Think about it. I mean, they all have words, syntax, grammar, verbs, adjectives, pronouns. You know, some presented in different ways. But all the books are really saying the same thing. Now, you could think either one of two things from that type of conclusion. You could either think, Wes didn't read all the books, which would be true. Or you would think, if Wes did pull off reading all the books, man, did he do a bad job. And I think when we hear people make statements like, well, all religions are the same. All religions lead to God. All religions have the same purpose in, in calling us to moral claims. I think we can conclude one of two things. Either that person hasn't really investigated all the religions, all the worldviews, or if they have, they've done it really, truly poorly. I think we can come to those types of conclusions. You see, all other worldviews, particularly religious worldviews, are based, I want to argue, on one of three things. They're either basing your salvation on pragmatism. Do this and you'll be saved. Or they're basing it on experientialism. You know, feel this and you'll be saved. Or they're basing it on intellectualism. Know these things and you'll be saved. It's either one or a combination of these things that really comes down to all the world religions. You need to feel right, or you need to think right, or you need to do right. But in the end, that all comes down to you. And in the end, it's going to lead to either you, you know, doing or feeling or thinking right and being very proud of yourself, but maybe becoming a little bit ignorant, and it's, it's almost always going to force you into looking down on the people who aren't. Or you're not going to be doing and feeling and thinking right, and that's going to cause you to have a lot of anxiety, have a lot of despair, that you're not measuring up to the standards. But ultimately, that's what it comes down to. If you're saved by your standards, you will always fall into the trap of either being bold and self-confident, or you're going to be humble and understanding and insecure, but you can't be both. 
But the Christian faith is not based on your actions, on the way you act or the way you feel or the things that you know. It's not. Because all that puts salvation in your hands and turns it into moralism. And if the Bible is clear on one thing, it's that moralism is a dead, rotten, stinking thing. And this is the difference between what we call the gospel, the good news, and I think what we see in world religions. Dead religion says, I obey, and therefore I am accepted. The gospel says, I am accepted, therefore I obey. The religious way is based on fear and insecurity, not doing or feeling or thinking right. And in one sense, Scripture is very clear that all good people go to heaven. I think that's unequivocal. The problem is, Scripture is also very clear that no one is good but God alone. Your application to join the Trinity has been denied. You fail the minimum requirements. And so you're stuck with a problem, right? And that's where the gospel steps in, because the gospel says, what if it's not dependent on your record, but on Jesus's? What if it's not dependent on your actions, but on Jesus's? What if it's not dependent on your life, but on Jesus's? You know, if you study worldly perspectives, you find not only is this true, but all of these perspectives are really a version of survival of the fittest. You do right, you think right, or you feel right, and you get to the top of that ladder. This is true sociologically as well. In society, it's the strong or the rich or the powerful or the most knowledgeable that are on top. I think where Christianity really sets itself apart is that in the Christian narrative, the fittest sacrifices himself for their survival of the weakest. That's not something you find in other worldly perspectives. And so in that sense, the claim that all religions lead to God is a false claim. It's a claim that doesn't actually respect, like I talked about at the beginning, what the religions claim to believe to begin with. And it's a claim that doesn't make sense when you evaluate the religious worldviews. And it's only Christianity, the Judeo-Christian worldview, the worldview of what we call the Old and New Testaments, that communicate clearly that not only are you a person with intrinsic worth, that you have the image of God, the Imago Dei, imprinted on you, and that's why you have worth and value, but it's the only one that will claim to draw you into right relationship with your creator as the individual who bears his image. You've been very patient. You've listened for quite a while now. Um, I think Jacob will, will open it up for some, some Q&A. But thank you very much for listening up until this point. Walked in late. We can text questions to that number. Um, and we had a couple come in. First of all, Wes, thank you so much. Um, let me roll through here for a second. Um, I'm just glad you invited me back after I marked your papers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh boy. Um, this one came in when you were alluding to. The idea of, um, oh, what's the word? You were commenting on just the way our world works with, um, what was the word he used? Drawing a blank. I'll just read the question. How do you engage with people on topics like this when we live in a world where people equate disagreement with hate speech? Because these, there's obviously a lot of emotion wrapped up in some of these people's worldviews. And, and when you approach topics like this with people, and how you might disagree with statements that my religion's the same as yours. How do you do that in, a, in the, this current cultural environment? Carefully. <laughs> I, I think uh, um, often w one of my excuse me, rules is when a conversation starts to get heated, I try to slow the conversation down and just simply say, can I ask you one question? If Christianity were true, would you believe it? 
I'm not saying Christianity is true. It's true, by the way. But if Christianity were true, it's a hypothetical, right? I'm not, I'm not making a, a value statement, but I'm saying on the possibility, on the hypothetical that Christianity is true, would you believe it? And often people say no. And at that point, I know that there's no use in proceeding with the conversation because that person is not actually interested in the truth. They're interested in trying to validate something or um, you know, come up with an excuse. And I find that often kind of reveals their purpose and intention in the conversation. Um, because if someone said, you know, if the flying spaghetti monster were true, would you believe it? I would say yes, because, you know, even if, if I'm a Christian, if it's a lie, even if it's a convenient lie, there's still no use in following a lie, right? So uh, I would be, in one sense, I have an obligation to the truth over and above, I have an obligation to Jesus. Now, Jesus was the way and the truth, and I think there's, that's unanimous, and so there's no, uh, there's no contradiction there. But ultimately, we, we, we should be pursuing the truth. Yeah, I have a friend, um, Tim Barnett. He actually lives in Newmarket. Uh, he works for an organization called Stand to Reason, and he always says he has a rule. If the other person uh, gets angry, he loses, and if he gets angry, he loses. I don't know if I 100% ascribe to that rule because I would lose... 99% of the time, but I think no, no, I think that's good. And and um, I took an apologetics course with uh, someone that Wes works with, Dr. Bannister, and he he pointed to the idea that there are red flags that can come up in conversations that you can realize someone's really not interested in in the dialogue, but more just to win. And and it's funny how he he says a similar thing, like maybe pursuing that specific conversation is not the most fruitful, fruitful thing at that point. But that doesn't mean your witness to them ends, right? I'm assuming this is a, a relationship that you have with an individual, right? That you can witness to them in the way that you live your life and in following conversations as you continue to engage with them. So, And you're not obligated to engage in every conversation. Some conversations are very useful to engage in and some are not. And so that requires a level of kind of experience and wisdom that you know takes a little bit of discernment um, and, and practice and time, but you can be casting pearls to swine and wasting your time. So here's another question. How would you describe the God of the Muslim faith versus the God of, the Christi the God of Christianity to a seeker? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Ultimately, I think I would say that, um, now I think Christianity is outside of a lot of these paradigms, but I think when you study world religions, you find that they're almost always either a religion based on justice or religion based on mercy. So for example, um, Buddhism and its understanding of karma is very justice oriented. You, you get what you deserve in the next life or the next stage, or they don't truly believe in reincarnation the same way that a Hindu does because they don't believe in a soul. but but karma is ultimately just. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. But the justice is at the expense of mercy. Islam, I think, is actually a religion based on mercy. Every chapter heading of the Quran, of the, the Islamic holy book, has this phrase, Bismillah, God the most uh, benevolent, the most merciful. Every chapter but one has this heading. And I think what you see in Islam is that the God of Islam is very merciful. However, I think he is merciful at the expense of his justice. He forgives arbitrarily. And that's problematic. Because in that sense, the God of Islam actually breaks his own law. And I think the difference between that and Christianity is that in Christianity, I think justice and mercy are met perfectly because at the point on the cross, the wrath of God is satisfied, justice is done, and therefore mercy is possible. God does not sacrifice his holiness and his holy law to forgive humanity. God the Son takes on the punishment that we deserve. And because of that, Mercy and grace are enacted. Let me also just say that mercy and grace are often confused, um, and I understand why, but mercy is not getting what you do deserve, right? That's why it's the opposite of justice. It's not getting what you do deserve. You deserve a punishment, you don't get it. That's merciful. Grace is then getting what you don't deserve. So when God enacts mercy, you don't get the punishment you deserve, 
And on top of that, he piles on grace, which is now you're adopted as a son and daughter of God the Most High. <laughs> you, don't, you don't deserve that. That's not something you've, you earn. And the, the only thing you contribute to that is your sin, which makes part of the equation possible. But that's it. <laughs> You contribute your, your sin. And so when we compare kind of the deity figures, I think that is a major one. The God of, of Islam is merciful, but I think it's at the expense of his justice. And like I mentioned, he is, he is so beyond and transcendent that the Muslim has a hard time with God having connection with humanity. Uh, the idea of a relationship with God is a Christian one. You don't find that in traditional Orthodox Sunni Islam because God is so transcendent. That's why he's not there in eternity because he's still way up here. And so when God communicates with humanity, he does it through the agency of angels. And so a lot of the time what Muslims read in the scriptures with things like covenant relationships, those are very problematic because a God who is so transcendent wouldn't stoop low enough to, to create those kind of binding covenantal relationship agreements with humanity, never mind becoming flesh and dwelling among us. That's completely foreign. And so ultimately, the God of Islam, although there are 99 divine names for Allah, and loving is one of them, love is not one of them. So the God of the Bible is described as love, and that's unique because the God of the Bible is relational. The God of Islam is not relational. That's why we bought Wes in tonight. <laughs> um, this one's a little bit more, I think, just general to kind of what you do with your studies and your profession. Um, can you share your most profound apologetic moment? No. Because <laughs> I don't know what that means. Yeah, profound apologetic maybe, moment. Maybe, like, what is it that drew you to it? This kind of area of... Um, is there a specific area of apologetics that you s typically spend more time looking at? Yeah, uh, so I don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I was born at a very young age. <laughs> <laughs> and like most stories, mine starts in Pakistan. So I, was, I, I grew up a missionary kid. I was born in Pakistan, spent a portion of my childhood in the Middle East. And so I always grew up in an environment where I was a um, ethnic and religious minority. Um, and that plays a lot into kind of the work that I, I do with Muslims apologetically. But it was actually my interest in apologetics uh, started a lot later after my parents had come back from overseas. And just before my 12th birthday, I was diagnosed with a rare neurological condition that left me paralyzed from the waist down. Now, spoiler alert, I'm not paralyzed anymore. So something happened. And the short story is that um, I, uh, on a, on a Wednesday, I was homesick with the flu, and what the doctors told me happened was I went down for a nap and my body's immune system attacked the base of my spinal cord instead of attacking the flu, you know, thanks, um, and, and severed the nerve endings and caused inflammation and left me uh, a paraplegic. And one month from the day that that happened, it, that happened on January 8th, on February 8th, I got out of bed on a Saturday morning, walked over to my wheelchair and sat down. And that was it. And it was actually the doctors who used the word miracle for the first time. They said, you know, we have no medical explanation. There's, there's no damage there. And so that marked a very powerful supernatural experience in my life because I truly believed I was healed. But despite that, I really struggled as a team. And I struggled because I, I was having a hard time kind of connecting the dots between this very experiential thing that happened and a lot of the kind of overarching intellectual questions that I was um, being posed with. And basically, I, I figured I knew what my parents raised me to believe, but if I believed it simply because they raised me to believe it, it wasn't the worst re reason by any means, but it also wasn't the best reason. And so I did a lot of uh, soul searching and investigating. It wasn't a crisis of faith by any means. I don't want to overplay that. Uh, and fortunately, I lived in a very unusual household where uh, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Book of Mormon, these were in the living room. <laughs> And so I did a lot of, you know, I read them, I uh, looked at them, and trying to have, you know, equal and balanced scales with the Christian worldview with others. And ultimately, I came to the conclusion that Christianity held up, and a lot of these others, they didn't answer the questions that I had in a way that was sufficient to 
the criteria that I was holding to them. Um, and so that really started kind of an interest. I couldn't have told you what the word apologetics meant at that point. Uh, for those who, of you who don't know, who that's not a familiar word to you, um, apologia is the Greek word meaning to give a defense or to give an answer. So in your Bibles, in 1 Peter 3.15, Peter is writing to the dispersed church in the ancient world, and in there he says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ will be ashamed of their slander. And that little prepositional phrase, to give an answer, is in the original Greek, pros apologia. And so we take that word in English and we add an English suffix on the end and we have what we call apologetics. So the, f the field and the discipline of giving answers for what you believe. So it's not limited to Christianity. Uh, I do a lot of work with Muslim apologists. Um, arguably there are atheist apologists. But that's where my interest kind of found its spark. And then I went off to university and I started interacting with all sorts of people who held positions from these other worldviews, and they would almost all say to me, Wes, those sound great, but they're all based on the Bible, and you can't trust the Bible. All you have is a translation of a translation of a translation. You don't even know if you got the right books. What about the Gospel of Thomas? What about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? You know, how many translations and editions and iterations has there been? There are dozens of English translations to begin with, and so I took that objection seriously. I thought, you know, if that's true, they're right in a sense. You know, I am staking my life on this Jesus guy. And the primary sourced evidence for him is found in the Bible, predicted in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. Jesus comes along. He makes pretty audacious claims, claims to be God himself. And then he predicts his own death and resurrection, and he does it and people who rise from the dead have more credibility and authority than people who don't rise from the dead. And so I said, you know, I need to take that seriously. And that started my road down what I believe is one of, if not the most important apologetics questions, which is, can we trust the Bible? Because if we can trust the Bible and its, its credibility, its authority, its veracity, its inspiration, then everything else falls into place. Wow, okay. Um... We have a story here, a brief story. I have a friend who says, a work friend, who says the Bible is fiction because who can make a pillar of salt or the story of the burning bush? He's a cynical person by nature, and I pray for him as he does not want to accept Christ and the Bible's scriptures. How can I help this believer? And that seems to tie into some of the stuff you're just saying. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, to a lot of skeptics of that kind of persuasion, I always say, if the first miracle happened, the other ones are, you know, uh, small slices. If God made everything out of nothing, pillars of salts and burning bushes and walking on water are pretty minimal. And he very well might agree that there was a starting point of the universe, right? The Big Bang... I would argue, cosmologically, is a certainty. Well, a big bang needs a big banger. And so it's the natural materialist who actually can't answer that question. But I believe, you know, in the beginning, God. And so if that happens, everything else is really not that big of a deal. And I think they might actually grant that one. That if everything can come from nothing, then the same person who made everything from nothing can probably turn water into wine. So, I mean, ultimately, in, a, in, in, in conversations and interactions like that, my goal is to ask more questions than I answer, to try to really get the person to think about what they're saying. So if they're saying, you know, the Bible is just, was it a myth? Is that what they said? The Bible is fiction? Uh, yeah, fiction. Yeah, and then they point out, like, ridiculous, ridiculous stories. Yeah, so I would really want to, I would really want to push them and say, okay, what do you mean by fiction? How are you defining that? Because I have friends who are archaeologists 
who, when you work in what is modern day uh, Syria, Palestine, and Israel, you basically take three written works with you. Or, sorry, not three, you take, you take five written works with you. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, sorry, six written works, I'm, I'll get there. Six written works, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, and then the writings of Josephus. Those are the six works that archeologists take because those are the works that are descriptors of what was going on in that geographical area. Archaeologists don't think it's fiction. <laughs> um, and that's irrespective of whether they're Christian, Jewish, atheist, whatever. When you read the Old and the New Testaments, I think first and foremost, you are reading history. Now, that's aside from the fact that, you know, there are genres in the Bible, and so, you know, there's poetry and there's um, all sorts of things that aren't necessarily just history and narrative and biography, but on the works that are w operating as history and narrative and biography, you can trust those things. And so for someone like that, I would really try to push them, what do you mean by fiction? And by that, how do, do, does a, a book like the Book of Acts, which is chock full of names and places and dates, how does that fit into your definition of, of fiction? because historians don't go that. And if, you're, if your big beef is miracles, then that's assuming that those things couldn't be true, but it's not actually proving that those things couldn't be true. Um, you have to assume that the supernatural doesn't exist and that it's an impossibility for a miracle to happen, but that's not an argument per se, it's just a, uh, it's just a statement. So I would really, you know, as much as is useful and possible. I try to have conversations where I'm asking more questions than I'm giving rebuttals and try to get that person to think about even what they themselves are claiming about what they mean by the Bible, what they mean by fiction, uh, what could be an explanation for some of these things and what's the highest probability that you know their explanations actually suffice in answering the historical question of, you know, if, if this is an event that took place, what was going on? Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really helpful. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, <clears throat> this might go beyond the scope of an apologist and more just a question to a fellow disciple of Jesus. I'm only here to answer apologist <laughs> questions. Um, how do you show love to someone who practices a different religion or even has different beliefs within Christianity, right? At what point do you speak truth? That's an apologetic question. Go um, for it. I think establishing relationships is very, very important. Now, a lot of my work is kind of guerrilla evangelism. I go in and I give a talk and I do a Q&A and then I leave, and hopefully I, I have relationships with the people who are organizing things. Um, and so sometimes I'm outside of an environment where I have an ongoing relationship with a person, but that's true for you know, the person asking the question, certainly, but all of us know people who are, hold other worldview perspectives. And I think what I would say is first and foremost, there are five Gospels, okay? You know the first four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The fifth is the life of the believer because your life is a living testimony to who Christ is. It's the good news. And so a lot of the people in our lives may never read the first four, but they're probably reading the fifth. And by reading the fifth, they may be encouraged to go back and read the other four. Now, the caveat to that is that there's a, a quote ascribed to St. Francis of Assisi, which he almost certainly did not say, which was, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. That is completely inaccurate. <laughs> you cannot preach the gospel without using words. <laughs> but the, like, tiny little micro speck of truth in that is that our lives will, as the believer, will usually communicate something that's different to someone who's, you know, living day in and day out with us. Because our lives are different, right? That verse that I quoted, 1 Peter 3.15, it's not actually talking to me whose job description is professional apologist. 
Because it says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. So I'm answering. That's not what Peter's talking about. Peter's talking about people who are asking you for the hope that you have. That assumes that your life is communicating some sort of hope and that people are asking you questions. Now that should both, you know, uh, convict and encourage us to live a life that expresses a little bit more hope. Um, but I think, you know, to people who hold other worldly perspectives, I certainly have people in my life. I have a very close friend of mine who uh, comes from a very different cultural background, very different religious background, and he is not convinced by anything I say. And every once in a while, I mean, I, I gave up trying to have the big conversations with him years ago for the simple reason that I didn't think it was getting me anywhere. Um, we were both wasting our time. And we were hurting our relationship. And so every once in a while, I'll just say, like, hey, you know, I'm here. If you ever want to talk about, you know, that stuff, I'm here. He knows that. And there have been times where we've kind of interacted, and he's asked something here and there. And I think that's very valuable. You know, we don't need to constantly be the Bible answer man or woman and the Christian encyclopedia. You know, that's exhausting. But we do need to be living a life that is worthy of Christ. And we need to be particularly praying for the opportunities for the Spirit to be opening up times where we can present the gospel very clearly and effectively, that we can give that answer for the hope that we have. And that requires, A, us being prepared, like Peter commends us to, um, but also making sure we're working in the work of the Spirit by asking for those opportunities and then making sure we're looking for them when they actually happen. And that there's definitely that healthy balance because I think sometimes we <clears throat> overestimate. We don't want to be underprepared, but we almost feel like we're never, never, never equipped enough to, to have these kinds of conversations with people. Yeah. But I think that element of relying on the Spirit to give you the words in the moment um, as we continue to engage in his word and engage in community yeah. um, is absolutely vital. And both Jesus and Paul commend us to be salt. And I think salt is an interesting analogy because salt has a number of qualities to it. Salt preserves. Salt um, seasons. Uh, salt changes its environment in the sense that, you know, what happens when you put salt on ice? Well, it chemically changes the environment by melting the ice. And salt irritates, right? Now, if all you're doing is irritating, you're salty in the wrong way. But I think the analogy throughout Scripture of calling us things like salt and light is that, you know, salt has those qualities to it. And so there's going to be a balance of preserving and seasoning and, and irritating at times. Oh, I was going to read one final question, but we just had one come in. Two more. Two more. You talked about your early division of your head knowledge and experience. Do you find there's a shift in apologetic approaches because of the shift from modernity, appeal to rationalism, and post-modernity, appeal to feelings? That's a very good question, and yes. And I think, actually, I've seen a shift since I started formally in the field of apologetics. I think when I was a teenager, people were asking, is God true? I think people now are asking, is God good? And it's kind of almost irrespective of whether God is true or not. Because I think when I, when I was a lot younger, in the early 2000s, the, the new atheist movement was very popular. You had guys like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett, and they were kind of proposing this militaristic form of atheism. And I think what happened is people got very enthralled with that and then realized that it had absolutely no answers to the questions of meaning and purpose and morality. <laughs> if all you are is a product of time plus matter plus chance, if you're just a bag of, of uh, atoms enclosed in meat bumping into other atoms enclosed in meat, then it doesn't really help you when you're struggling mentally or you, you, you have existential crises or uh, loved ones are sick or pass away. Like, the answers that, I mean, um, uh, Sam Harris had this quote, I can't remember which book it was in, but to the, uh, uh, he said, to the, to the grand question, why me, the universe answers, why not? Right? There's no, there's no ultimate 
purpose. There's no ultimate plan. And so I think a lot of people growing up who are very engaged in that actually realized that that, that was pretty fruitless. And so they started to, you know, the, I think there was a big uptick in things like the new age and being quote unquote spiritual but not religious uh, in this kind of nonsense. Um, and that also came with these more existential questions. And we see it within the cultural movements, right? People are very concerned with things like justice and equality and equity. I think that's, that's good. I mean, ultimately, Christianity has the true answers to a lot of those problems. But I think that has taken a shift in the old school apologetic approach of like, why do bad things happen to good people? Or, you know, can you trust the Bible? Or does God exist? And those questions are still vitally important, but I don't necessarily think they're always the questions that people are asking in our culture, because I think people want to know that they're loved, first and foremost, because we have a, a crisis of identity and a crisis of purpose within our society. And a lot of that is the divorcing of the Judeo-Christianity from the Judeo-Christian ethic, which still hangs around. It's still there. People assume it, they just don't know where it comes from. And so when you pull out, when you, uh, philosophers call it, um, they call it planting your feet firmly in midair. When you start to do that, and you forget that the foundation for things like ultimate truth and uh, objective morality, that that comes from the idea of being created in the image of God and that everybody has value intrinsically because of that. It's not extrinsically, it's not what you can contribute to society, but you are human, so you have value. That's a Christian thing. And so people still want to hold on to that, but they don't know where it comes from, and so they, they have existential crises. And so they're asking, the questions are far more, is God good more than it is, is God true? And I think in some ways, we should definitely be answering the is God good question, because there's a very good answer to that. But we also need to be pulling people, you know, kicking and screaming into the, but God is true. And so therefore, there, there's, there's a, a bigger question behind, there's a question behind the question you're actually asking. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, if you're familiar with Mark Sayers or the, um, oh, what was that podcast called? I'm drawing blanks today. Um, <clears throat> he describes uh, the post-Christian context as, as the kingdom without the king. So this idea that obviously the kingdom of God has these, these values <clears throat> and this center that uphold it. And the world we live in wants so many of those values, but they reject the kingship of Christ. And so what you're left with is this shell and these like vague ideas of concepts, um, but lacking the identity in Christ and leading to an identity crisis. Um, and so ultimately... Um, There's a great book on that subject that came out like two months ago, I think it was, by a guy named Glenn Scrivener called The Air We Breathe. That's very good. I don't think it's more than 300 pages. It's not super, super big. It's not the smallest book in the world. But that, that he looks at all of the, the... What are the assumptions of our modern Western society? So that actually leads into our final question. Um, Wes, right, you've I set been, that up. Yeah, I know, beautifully. Um, you've been tremendously helpful this evening. Um, but as we leave today, <clears throat> are there any resources like books, podcasts, etc., that you would recommend concerning defending or sharing our faith with those who hold different worldviews? So there's a website, <laughs> WesleyHuff.com <laughs> and ApologeticsCanada.com that are very helpful. Um, I have, if you go to WesleyF.com, on the, the main page, I have an article called The Apologetics Books That You Should Already Have on Your Bookshelf. And it's, I break all of the apologetics books that have helped me down by category. So whether that's the Bible or church history or atheism or um, LGBTQ and same-sex attraction issues, uh, I, I have them. And they're all Amazon.com links. Um, so if you're looking for resource, resources in that sense. Also, um, Apologetics Canada, we do a podcast every week uh, that you can subscribe to, the AC Pod. And um, we live in an age where there are so many resources. There's a lot of, the internet is both the best thing and the worst thing at the ex exact same time. There's a lot of garbage out there, but there are a lot of very solid, good 
resources like wesleyhoff.com. And, um, and even like Jacob and I were talking before, and uh, there's, there, there's a guy on YouTube, Mike Winger. He's a pastor. He does apologetic content. His stuff is excellent. There are organizations like I mentioned, Tim Barnett and Stand to Reason. Um, there, are, there are tons of very useful resources that are out there and that are, are very accessible. It's not all academic head stuff. Uh, it's, there's a lot of, it's been translated for the average person to be able to. Um, That's perfect. I think maybe what we'll do is in our, in the loop tomorrow, I'll include a link to maybe some of those resources and, and some of the stuff that Wes mentioned there. Um, why don't we give a hand for Wes one more time?